Hello, everybody. This is Nick Vlahos with Nick in the Morning, the podcast on pjstar.com and Facebook Live and wherever you choose to see it these days. We were on camera, we were on radio, or audio, I should say, not radio. And we were here with a TV veteran who was turned uh, public relations person for the American Cancer Society here in uh, Peoria. It's Audrey Williams. How are you doing today, Audrey? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Well, thanks for being here. I appreciate that. And part of the reason you're here is to talk about a big fundraising effort that the Cancer Society is undergoing right now that I'm also a part of too so we'll get to that in a little bit but I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about your your history with the the Cancer Society and before that too because you know before you be became a Cancer Society employee you also were a TV personality here in town too um, you were with Channel 25 at one time 19 w- and 25 okay you know they're together um, once I got out of college they were already merged so yeah I worked for both of them okay um, I started out as a producer and mm-hmm. then became a reporter. I did fill in weather. I did fill in anchor. The only thing I didn't do was do sports. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some people aren't perfect in that way, <laughs> says the former sports reporter here. Uh, you, you're from this area originally. You're from Farmington originally, yep, is that I went right? Yeah, Farmington High School. Okay, when did you graduate from high school? Uh, 2006. Okay, and you went to ISU then after yep, that? ICC for two years, okay. got my associates, and then ISU has a really great uh, TV program. Yeah, you work for TV10 at ISU? Yep, TV10 and WZND. I did radio. Mm -hmm. So they've got a great uh, program for for what I wanted to go into. So I was excited with that school. Did you always want to go into TV, radio? I mean, is this something you always wanted to do, or is this something you kind of came to lately? In high school, when they're asking you what you want to do when you grow up and you really kind of have to decide, I I just said, I want to be a, a TV reporter. So when I went to IACC, I took a class in television just to test the water, see if I would like it before I declared a major, Mm -hmm. and I loved it. So the second semester, I took another class, and I loved it. So I knew that this was the right path for me, and I just kept taking it all in and really enjoyed it. When you got out of school, I mean, did you intern any place else, or did you? You said you worked in another radio station at, at one time. Is that right, or was it TV at WZND? Station? That's the student radio station at okay. ISU. Um, in college, while I should have probably interned at a, a news station, I interned down in Nashville at CMT Country Music Television. Oh, nice. And I love country music, and I thought it would be a good exposure to see a different side of television. Um, so I enjoyed it, but what I really wanted to go in, what I thought eventually was news. So I um, got a part-time job as soon as I got out of college at WEK. I want to go back to the, the country music TV experience a little bit. That's a little non-traditional like career path, right. I think, for somebody who's going into TV news. What did you do down there? Um, I was part of the production department. Um, so we, you know, they have their own shows that CMT produces. Mm-hmm. So we had to quality control them before they hit the air. Um, I did a lot of just logging tapes. Um, they put on the country music uh, uh, CMT Music Awards in the summer. So I got to help with that. I got to work the red carpet and hold cue cards. And it was, there was a lot of excitement for the the summer interns. That's for sure. That sounds pretty cool. I mean, what was your, did you, you had to meet somebody, right? Some, some artists or somebody like that, that you maybe you've been listening to or watching and who was the biggest celebrities that you actually encountered when you were doing that? On my first day, when I was sitting at my desk, we just, you know, did orientation and everything. Taylor Swift walked by my desk and she was really huge back back then I mean she still is but that was the first person that walked by I was like oh this is cool and on red carpet I got to meet everybody you know Dirk Bentley Lady Annabellum all those mm-hmm. people were you know taking the red carpet so it was cool who's your favorite my current favorite yeah Chris Stapleton. I love Chris Stapleton okay. I just saw Brad Paisley last night in St. Louis oh, oh did Louis. you well how was that it was okay. Um, I bought the tickets at an ACS benefit, so um, he's not probably my most favorite, but he still put on a great show, and Dustin Lynch was there, and it was an outside amphitheater, so it was a good evening for that. That's a good – was it Riverport, I guess, or whatever they're calling it these days? Hollywood Casino Amphitheater. Yeah, that, that's a good Maryland place to see Heights. a show. Yeah. 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 I, I saw Rush there about six, seven years ago, and we had a great time. It was yeah. a lot of fun. I well, just hope it wasn't, like, too hot. Seat. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty warm, but can't complain for the end of September and, and that kind of weather. No, I not, enjoyed it. Not at all. Uh, so how did you get from there back to Channel 25, back to Peoria again? Did you pursue something here in town, or where were you looking? So that was between my junior and senior year that I had that internship in Nashville. And then um, – 
right after I graduated, I had to get serious and get a job, and there was a part-time position open, so I took it, and then shortly after that, there was a full-time job that opened, so I was able to switch to a full-time producer, so I produced um, the morning show, Daybreak, Mm -hmm. which is interesting hours, and then I became the evening HOI producer, but you know I always wanted to be a reporter so I was able to keep up on those skills when they had an opportunity to go out in the field and report and then as soon as the next reporter position opened I was able to transition into that yeah because I think you and I first met when you were uh, covering city council at the same time that Um, I was and before five years ago yeah I became the city report or beat reporter Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about politics that you know, I think I think young reporters in college need to have more political background because it's so much of what we cover, and you know you don't. You some don't know. some people don't uh, have that kind of background or just kind of thrown yeah. into it. Just just even reading an agenda, a council agenda. You know, there's a lot that goes into that that you have to look for and, and find those stories. So how comfortable was it for you when you first started doing that? We had a lot of experience in the newsroom at that time, so. Mm-hmm. I always had somebody else look over the agenda or I would highlight some things that I was questioning that might be good stories and go to them for some more background or history to see if it was a good story. So Mm -hmm. I was able to learn a lot from the, you know, older folks that were in the newsroom that had the Peoria experience. Yeah, you get people like, you work with Tom McIntyre, you work with Gary Moore. Sean Newell was. Yeah, Sean was another one. Yep. Yeah, that helps a lot. That institutional knowledge can be really valuable. Yes. How, what was it like covering news in your hometown? I mean, did you enjoy that? Was it uh, maybe a little too familiar in some ways? People recognize you. It's like, yeah, I remember when you were in high school or any of that sort of thing. I mean, what was the experience like? I really enjoyed it. I think I was able to tell a better story because I, while I was still young, I had more background than some of the, the new reporters that they brought in from you know, various places across the country. I, I knew you know, what had happened with a building or a situation 10 years ago. I was mm-hmm. able to call on people that I knew in the community because I've, I've been here. So it really helped me be a better reporter, just knowing the area and knowing the people. And, you know, when I thought about switching to a, a different market, a bigger market and moving, I knew I wouldn't be, I would be fine, but mm-hmm. I wouldn't be as successful as a reporter because I wouldn't have that background and I enjoyed knowing what I knew going into a story. Did you that ever sense. did you ever consider that moving I mean going up to a bigger I mean Peoria is a lot like it's a lot like minor league baseball in that you start out in a smaller market and you try to work your way up to a place like Chicago or St. Louis or Indy or somewhere like that and Peoria is considered a smaller market by a lot of people. Did you ever consider, you know, maybe hang you know try to go for the big time someplace? Yeah. Uh, you know, they really pride themselves or, or they did at News 25 as your home team. And I was from here, and I wanted to stay and move up and be a Tom McIntyre, be on the anchor desk and, and put in a 30-year whatever career there. I wanted to do that. When I didn't see that that was going to fit after several years, I started getting a little antsy, and, and so I kind of saw two paths. I could make a jump, find a different market and move, or I could switch career paths. You mm-hmm. know, I wasn't going to find something else in – TV media here so um, that's kind of the crossroads I was at when I came to that realization. What's uh, what's your current thoughts on the current state of uh, broadcast media in this city in this market? Um, It's been interesting over the past couple years seeing you know long time people leave Mm -hmm. and I think Peoria really for a long time enjoyed like we were talking about that institutional knowledge of those anchors um, you know, friendly faces, and now it's just the younger people, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure cheaper labor, so um, I think Peoria unfortunately misses out, but it's it's typical for a market this size, I think, to have that turnover. Yeah. That's the one thing that, that kind of bothers me, I guess, about the current state of it is that we don't have – at least since I've been in Peoria, which is over 30 years now, we've always had at least a few people at every station that have been long timers and yeah. trusted, you know, people that have been on the, the camera every night, guys like McIntyre, guys like Bob Larson over Channel 31. 
uh, even you know way back like Clark Smith and people like that in 19. I think about the only person like that these days that's still on the air is probably Jim Manson. We have Gary Moore and Gina Well, Gary Morris. is too. That's yeah. true. And Gina Morris has been back and forth, but now she's yeah. back into it again. Right. Yeah. See, see those guys are working. Gary and Gina are like working at the same time I'm working, so I never <laughs> right. get to watch them. Right. And before I was like asleep when they were working, so you know I never got to pay much yeah. attention to them. And Mark and Gretchen had been there for so long. It, it's really sad to see them go and, and leave that anchor chair. Yeah, they, it seems like their departure was not exactly uh, ideal. No, and not planned um, on their part. No, it's a, it can be a, a cruel business sometimes. And in Absolutely. Peoria especially, it seems to be really cruel <laughs> a lot more than it, it has been. What do you think is the biggest story or the most interesting story that you covered when you were in TV news? What was it? I'd say the biggest thing I probably covered was the Washington tornadoes. Mm -hmm. That was, a, you know, a huge part for a long time. You know, even obviously the day of I was there, um, the follow-ups, the, you know, the stories that you, you know, heard from people and were able to share with the community, and then all of the follow-ups and the recovery and the rebuilding. Um, that was probably a big one. Um, the death of Gary Sandberg was yep. one that always stands out for me. Um, yeah. I'd say those were the, the top ones. Mm -hmm. Any that affected you, like, personally in any way, shape, or form, considering how many people you know around here or anything? As I was going through college, I quickly learned that I had to shut off my emotion when telling a story. Um, otherwise, it was not – it was, it was going to be a hard business to be in when you're telling those stories. But I remember talking to a mom that her son was run over by a vehicle on his bike – and hearing the pain in her voice, I can still uh, feel how I felt. And it, it, while it was while I was good at shutting off those emotions um, and being able to tell the story, um, you know, you you still have to feel it when a, a mom loses her little boy like that. It's those are the hardest ones I think to cover are ones when I mean we see if you've been in this business long enough you cover murders and you cover traffic accidents and all that sort of thing, but I think the hardest ones are when there's a kid involved when a child dies prematurely trying to talk to parents after that you know either if the kid was sick or if he was killed you know in an accident or killed in gun violence or something along those lines it's right. always you know you're you're still human I mean you're a reporter but right. you're still human at the same time you know yeah but if you take that emotion home with you every night. You know, you, you just can't. No. Well, I imagine in a lot of ways it's like being a police officer or a firefighter. Right. You know, you, There's you, a lot of jobs like that, a doctor, a nurse. Yeah, same kind of deal. If you, took every, if you were a doctor and you took every patient's death, like, seriously, you'd probably drive you crazy and you'd be out of the profession in no time. Right. So. You have to be able to turn off that emotion in, in this career and many others. Yes, absolutely so. Well, how many years ago have you been – when did you join the Cancer Society? It's been a couple of years now, hasn't it? Um, it's just been a little more than two years. Yeah, okay. I was at 19 and 25 for about five years, and I've been out of that business for a little over two. Okay. What was it about that job that attracted you? So I was looking for a while for the right fit because I loved what I did as a reporter. I mean, it was an enjoyable job. I never wanted to be a sit at, you know, be sit behind the desk kind of a job. Um, and, and this came up, and my cousin works in the American Cancer Society out in Colorado. So I sent her the job description. I said, do you think I would like this? Do you think I would be good at it? And she said, absolutely. So I, I looked into it further. I got some more information. And I really thought it would be a good fit from the skills that I had in television, you know, going out in the community, talking with people. Um, and then, obviously, I had to develop some new skills. And mm -hmm. um, I've really enjoyed it. It has been a good fit for me. What, what ex Can you just describe for the people that are listening or watching right now, what it is exactly you do? What, what does the job entail? So my title is Community Development Manager. I find people in the community that want to get involved in the American Cancer Society and find a way to make that happen. Um, it is a lot of Relay for Life and fundraising, but we are branching out and doing a lot more um, like Real Men Wear Pink mm -hmm. or Mix for a Cure or finding different ways that the community wants to do something different and still be involved in ACS. So uh, we're a volunteer organization. There's one of me and I've got five counties I think now. So I've got... Um, Which counties are those, just to clarify? Sure. Peoria, Tazewell, Fulton, and Marshall and Putnam counties. Okay. Um, so a lot of it is finding people that want to volunteer and give back their time, 
giving them the tools and, and giving them some guidance on what we need to make things happen. I've got great volunteer committees in each of those communities. Um, so it's, it's just finding people and having them find a way to give back to ACS, mm -hmm. whether they're time, talents, or treasures. What's the biggest difference that you found between working for a TV station and working for the American Cancer Society? Just on a basic level, you never knew what you were going to do when you walked into the news station on a given day. I mean, you could kind of have a plan, like I've got counsel tonight or, you know, going down to Springfield because they're in session, something like that. But then a murder could happen and you'd get pulled in a different direction. You'd be headed to a story and something big would happen and you'd have to um, change direction. With ACS, things are pretty much planned. I've got you know months planned out of, mm -hmm. of meetings and um, different opportunities in the community. So just on a basic level, it's, it's that, that work day, I guess, the planning of it. What is the biggest fundraiser that you do every year? So Relay for Life is the biggest fundraiser that's ever been created in the world. We've got Relay for Lifes around the world. Um, there's a lot of communities here that have great Relay for Lifes, traditional Relay for Lifes. McLean County has a huge one. They're one of the biggest in the area. Marshall Putnam has a huge one. But in Peoria, you know, we noticed that Relay for Life didn't really work. So we had to change it and be relevant to the community. So we did Night of Hope in Peoria this year. Um, Mix for a Cure is a new one at the end of October. We're just trying to stay relevant in the community with how they want to fundraise because there's so many different charitable organizations. People are asked to give all the time. So we have to be different and, and tell them why mm -hmm. we're different. Why do you suppose Relay for Life didn't work as well here as it did in other places? I think um, just given there's so much that people are involved in now you know kids have soccer all day on on Saturdays or kids have um, you know traveling baseball tournaments you know I wasn't as busy as kids are now when I was younger so parents are pulled in lots of different directions so the traditional relay for life is a 24-hour event you have a team and you fundraise and then during that 24-hour relay somebody is supposed to be on the track at all times from your team that's the very very traditional mm -hmm. And, and people don't want to, they want instant gratification kind of in, in this day and age. They want to pay their $25, go do a walk on a Saturday morning and be done by 10 o'clock. There's so many walks out there that we have to be different from sure. that. So we're trying to give them that shorter time frame in the Peoria area, um, give them some entertainment, some food, very meaningful ceremonies because we want to have that component of the luminaria where we honor people, we remember people, we support people that are going through a cancer treatment. So we're different, but we're giving people what they want out of that experience. Now, how do you think that worked out this time when you guys did it? I mean, was, would you deem it a success? Yes. Would you? It went really well. We got a, a lot of great feedback. We've got some things that we want to improve on for next year, but there were more people out there than in previous years. Uh, we had it on the riverfront. Everybody hmm. wants to go to the riverfront in Peoria for events. That's where you think of having an event in Peoria. So we had it there. It was a better location. It was on a Friday evening. So, you know, you got off work, you could go do that, be a part of it, and you still had your whole weekend. You weren't giving up a 24-hour period in your weekend and then recovering because you're exhausted from staying up all night. Mm -hmm. So it just, it seemed to fit the Peoria community better. We set out at the beginning of the year with a financial goal, and, you know, we have 12 months to do that. And they hadn't come close to their Peoria goal for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. And we hit it before closing ceremonies that night. And we had several more months to hit it. Um, wow. So financially, um, it was successful. We had a lot more people involved and engaged. We had more survivors out there so we could celebrate them. It was just all around, I think, a better event. That sounds great, actually. Uh, fantastic, to be, to be honest. How much can you give us a ballpark figure about how much money the local cancer society raises and where it's allocated? Where where does the money go? You know, that's I think I know we're over a million dollars out of the Peoria office that we fundraise. Mm -hmm. I can't give you an exact number right now. Um, the number one thing ACS does is research. That's how we're finding answers having better treatment, earlier detection. And so that's allocated on the national level. 
there's money right here in Illinois. I think 17 million right now is being funded in research in Illinois um, at U of I, universities up in Chicago. Um, and then there's patient programs and services. So there's people here locally that get wigs if they're going through treatment and mm -hmm. lose their hair and want a wig. We have a wig program. We have wig banks here. Um, there's a lot of people here locally that use our ride to recovery program road recovery program sorry about that and so if they need a ride to treatment and don't have a friend or family member or, or the, those people are working we'll pair them with a volunteer driver because we don't want that to stop them from getting healthier so a lot of people here locally use that program we have a lodging program people don't always get can't always get the treatment here in Peoria that they need hmm. so they might have to stay elsewhere um, St. Louis Iowa City Texas wherever it may be that they have their best treatment um, we don't want that to be an additional cost for them when they're already paying so much in medical bills so we have a Hope Lodge program in most of the major major medical cities we have a Hope Lodge and ECS Hope Lodge where people can stay for free and their caregiver as well if we don't have a Hope Lodge, we more than likely have a hotel partner. Right here in Peoria, we have, I think, five now hotel partners. So if somebody has to come to Peoria and get treatment and they live more than 45 minutes away, they can stay for free in a hotel. Beautiful. Yeah, and so in most of the cities, we have hotel partners um, just because we don't want that to be a reason why they're not going to get their best treatment because they also have to pay for a hotel for x number of weeks or whatever it is yeah that's that's a major thing if you're getting treatment from outside the city because if you don't have relatives in whatever city you're in it can really start to add up after Absolutely. a while if you're staying in a hotel for extended periods of time you know with either if you're being treated or if your loved ones are going someplace to to help you with the treatment too i mean right. either way I mean, what's been the most rewarding aspect of working with acs I love hearing survivors and their stories. Um, I think it's interesting how they found their cancer because I think they need to tell that story so other people know what signs and, and symptoms to look for in their bodies. Um, I, one in particular stands out. A mom and a daughter were diagnosed with the exact same breast cancer. I think it was about 10 years apart. And hearing the treatment from the mom versus the daughter was just amazing to me because in just 10 years, the research um, that had been done to make her treatment that much better was, I, I know that we're doing the right thing and making improvements because she had better treatment. And in 10 mm -hmm. years, that person is gonna have better treatment. Um, so I think it really is hope for more cures. That, that's all very true. And I can vouch for this personally because, I mean, you know this, and I don't know how many people out there listening and watching know this, but I'm a cancer survivor myself. I was diagnosed two years ago with Hodgkin's lymphoma and, you know, went through chemotherapy and the whole thing. And, you know, in the 60s, one of my relatives also was diagnosed with Hodgkin's, and they basically told him, well, you got five years, and you probably ought to get your house in order a little bit and try to live as best you can during that time because there's really not much we can do for you. And now, uh, Hodgkin's, about 90 to 95% of people are, who end up getting it are end up cured from it. And uh, that's what my doctor said to me, too. It's like, you know, most, just about everybody in your situation, if you can get through the treatment okay, then uh, you're probably going to be all right. So, you know, knock on wood. <laughs> so far, so good. But it, it's just amazing the advances that are made. And like you said, these days, five years can be an eternity when it comes to that as far as what it was like then and what it's like you know down the road you know in 2027 it's going to be totally different than it is now and presumably with better outcomes for everybody right i've got three little nephews and i hope that they never hear the words you have cancer and so what i'm doing now what we're doing as a community now um what acs is doing in research I know is helping the next generation, and that is the most rewarding. You know, wouldn't it be great to just get an inoculation or something like that and just say, here, you know, you don't have to worry about cancer then after that? Right. I think someday they'll do that, and I think someday they'll look upon chemotherapy the way that we look upon, like, bloodletting. You know, it's just so primitive, and it's so old, and it's so harmful because, you know, trust me, everything they say about chemo, <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, it just makes you, you, you feel like you're up, you know, the cure sometimes is worse than the disease. disease. But uh, it works. And it, it, sometimes it doesn't work, but most, a lot of times it does work. But uh, at some point, something that makes things a lot more easy and uh, 
more palatable for people and where they don't have the side effects like you do with something like that. I think it's coming. It's just going to take a little while. Absolutely. And that's going to kind of bring us to our next point about Real Men Wear Pink. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that fundraiser? Absolutely. So ACS has been doing Real Men Wear Pink across the nation for a while now. October is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So we're bringing this program to Peoria and we're very excited about it. Uh, we've asked 11 prominent men in the community to be real men, wear pink, talk about breast cancer in the community, talk about it on social media, and then also get creative and raise some funds for the mission of ACS. We're asking each man to raise $2,500. If they are all are successful or when they are all successful, that will be $27,500 for the mission of the American Cancer Society, which you know is incredible. Um, so you know, we've kicked off officially. Uh, today was our launch. We're going to be going through um, towards the end of October. There's a website. You can click on the guy, support the guy. And uh, well, I'm excited to start seeing the pink in the community and just the general awareness that these guys are going to bring. We've got you know, the city of Peoria mayor, Washington mayor, um, Washington Chief McCoy. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a business owner. We've got so a Dave financial Zimmerman, the, the chairman of the Tazewell County Board. He's also yeah. involved with this. Peoria County Coroner, mm -hmm. Jamie Harwood. So mm -hmm. just a really good group of guys. Mm -hmm. They've they've all got a platform um, or something that they can talk about this, and we're excited to have them on board. With us. I do have to correct you on something. You said eleven well-known guys, ten well-known guys, and me. <laughs> and then you. <laughs> yeah, and then there's and then there's Nick. Okay, I'm I'm participating in this fundraiser as well. And, uh, you know, I, I would prefer you donate through my portal. But then again, you know what, if you give it to anybody else, that's great, too. Just the, the key thing is just raising the money and raising the awareness as well. You know, it is breast cancer. It, it's focused on breast cancer, but it also other cancers are involved here, too. I mean, it's, it's the mission of the ACS is not just one cancer. It's all cancers. I'll correct you on that. A you're right. ACS is all cancers. Mm -hmm. And we put money towards research for all cancers. This campaign in particular, it is completely earmarked for breast cancer okay. initiatives. Um, this is the only one we really earmark uh, something like that for. Um, so it, 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 it does all go to breast cancer patient program services research. Very cool. And don't forget, September is also Lymphoma Awareness Month. So. You know, I'm very aware of it. I hope maybe now you're maybe aware of it, and we'll also give some additional money to the Cancer Society or to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society if you're so engaged too. That would that would be a wonderful thing. How can people donate to the Real Men Wear Pink campaign? So the easiest way to do it is to just Google Real Men Wear Pink of Peoria, Illinois. The page, the ACS page, will come up. Mm -hmm. You can see all of our handsome guys. Click on one and support one. But the easiest way, it's, it's not a super easy website. So just Google it and you'll find it. I also have posted links to it from uh, my Facebook page, Nicholas Vlahos. Just look that up on Facebook and click right on it. I've got it on there at least two or three times. And the money's rolling in, which I'm glad to say. So that that's wonderful. Just keep it up. We also have an American Cancer Society of Peoria, Illinois Facebook page. And I've part started posting links on there, mm -hmm. pictures from the kickoff. So you can find it there as well. You mentioned Mix for a Cure a moment ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Because that's, that's a new thing that you guys yes, are doing. Yes, it's a brand new fundraiser as well. I'm very excited for this one. I had a gentleman come to me um, after his mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and um, you know she had successful treatment and from what I hear is doing really well but he wanted to give back to the American Cancer Society he came up with this great idea for uh, a mixology and cocktail evening um, we've, we finally came with up with a name mix for a cure so it's going to be October 27th at the Pier Marquette in the ballrooms we're going to have area bars serving sample specialty cocktails and you'll get to vote on it it'll be a fan vote with uh, best overall, best presentation, and most creative. So you'll really, you know, be trying a lot more than if you go to the bar and, you know, order your, your same favorite mm -hmm. drink over and over. You'll get to try some new things. And then on stage for, you know, the entertainment portion, have you seen the show Chopped on Food Network? Yes. So contestants get a mystery basket of ingredients and have 20 minutes or whatever it is to make a dish. So it'll be like that, but with mixology. We've got some great mixologists in Peoria that are kind of, I would say, not very well known for their talent. 
So they'll be on stage. They'll get a mystery basket, and um, they'll have a full bar, a full pantry, and they'll have 20 minutes to make a cocktail or four cocktails for our judges panel. And we'll have a couple different rounds um, until we crown our master mixologist. And there'll be food, and there'll be a light-up dance floor, and a DJ, and a silent auction. So there'll be a lot going on that night. Anything that like has anything to do with creative uses for alcohol? I'm fully 100 percent behind. That sounds that sounds like wonderful. How can people uh, get tickets to this event? Yep. Um, so it is. Uh, are going to be a really nice event. You're going to get a lot of cocktails. You're going to get food. Um, it, it's going to be a great evening out, and we would love the support. Tickets are on sale now at mixforacure.com. That is an easy website, mixforacure.com. Um, go ahead and purchase your tickets, and we'd love to have everyone. Fantastic. Anything else you want to say before we call it a day? No, I really appreciate you having me here. Well, thanks for being here, Audrey. I really appreciate it too. And, and thanks for being a real man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my known real man. I do have a pink shirt. I have a pink dress shirt at home, and I, I did not wear it today. I just I wore it last week. I actually. got you a pink tie and yes. pink socks. Yes, yeah, so Audrey brought me some swag today. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it's like I'm going to be all pinked out for, yeah. from now until You'll have to through. Take the... some pictures and post them for everybody. Absolutely, I and mean, I'm doing that. I already took a picture of myself in a pink shirt, and I posted that on the website, and you know, got the slings and arrows from my friends. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing wearing pink for? But hey. The cause is just, the cause is right, and anything we can do to help promote that and promote cures and uh, the end of cancer as we know it, Absolutely. sooner rather than later, is the best thing we can do. That's all we can hope for. Indeed. Thanks a lot. Audrey Williams from the American Cancer Society. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time on Nick in the Morning, the podcast.